Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hyperconscious Podcast. Alan, what is Hyperconscious? Once you understand why something is the way that it is, now you have the power to change it. Great conversations with great people and great questions are the keys to the kingdom of unlocking your consciousness. Every single action that you do starts as a thought. When you control the way you think, you will control the way you act, and you will control the way you live. That is hyper-conscious. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, episode of the Hyper-Conscious Podcast. You like that little cadence there? Yeah. Uh, today, <laughs> Alan and I are lucky enough to sit down with Jarek Robbins. He is a peak performance coach, self-help author, professional speaker, and his ultimate goal is to change the entire world. Jarek Robbins, it was a dream come true to have him on the podcast. I read his book over a year ago with my ex-girlfriend, Jenny, and we loved the book. Um, he's very, very caring, and there's a quote from his book right now that's very relevant to the way the podcast went. Here it is. The challenge lies in making the shift from a cognitive understanding to an emotional understanding. This is the difference between knowing what to do and actually doing it. Jarek was so good at giving us perspective on how important the little things are and how important it is to create a lot of meaning behind the little things. Yeah, he's done a lot of traveling. He has a lot of perspective from that. And then he also, um, he dropped so much knowledge regarding, like Alan said, the little things, being grateful for the little things, being happy with what you have, because if you're not happy with what you have, how will you ever be happy with what you're going to get? So um, he dropped an hour's worth of knowledge. It was next level, and we hope you enjoy it. Talk to you soon. Bye. No, no, no. Um... Geographically, 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 this is cool. So I would say make sure that pretty face is showing. Yes, true. They're gonna want to see that thing. They're gonna want to see that thing, Alan. That face. You good? Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. This is usually the part where I would do the guest introduction, but today is a very special day, and Alan has been talking about this man for a long time, eagerly waiting to get him on the show, so I'm going to let Alan do the full introduction. Yes, so for all the listeners, uh, I read Jarek's book. This is Jarek Robbins. Um, about a year ago, me and my ex-girlfriend actually um, used to listen to this book on our way to Oakland, Maine on Audible, and also before bed, after we did what I used to, what I call the, the gratitude game, we'd talk about what we're most grateful for, and then we'd put on the sleep timer on Audible and listen to Jarek's book, which in hindsight, the book is a super practical, action-oriented book, and I remember being this one night where I couldn't fall asleep because I was so excited to make positive change. I was up till like 2 a.m. just contemplating life. And so Jarek is now on the show, which is very cool. And the universe works in mysteri mysterious ways, Jarek. Um, Jenny, that was the first time I've spoken to Jenny in three months, actually, was this morning. And I got to tell her that you're coming on the podcast. So this is so cool. Ah, oh, how fun. <laughs> so we want to open up with uh, a couple cool questions here. So um, your book is called Live It, and it's predicated on something that I've kind of been talking to the listeners about for a really long time. So Jim Rohn had this whole study, practice, and teach type of framework for mastery and for getting better at not only just living, but any sort of craft. And your book is based on something similar, which is learn it, live it, and then give it, which is kind of similar to study, practice, teach. Do you want to please introduce yourself to the listeners? Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came up with that framework. Sure. Um, so... What's up, everybody? My name is Jarek Robbins. Uh, where we focus day to day is performance coaching. What our what our outcome is as an organization and company is to reach the people who need us most at the moment they need us with the message they need. Uh, the fun part is we don't know who they are, where they are, what they need, but every day it's our opportunity to go out there and serve them. Very cool. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> and, and and so every day that's what we're doing. 
through all the different vehicles we use. I get labeled and titled a coach, a, a speaker, a consultant, all these different things, which are these are all activities we perform within our organizations, an author, all this stuff. Uh, but, but the truth is all of those things are vehicles to do the exact same activity, which is to reach the people that need us most with the message they need at the moment they need it. And we're blessed every single day of the week now to receive little messages from people all over the world that are as simple as, wow, I really needed to see this today. And as profound as, um, you know, a, a letter we received from a uh, Air Force person who had been deployed multiple times, who was struggling immensely with PTSD, who ran across my book because a friend told her about it. She read it and she just wrote me a letter and said, hey, I've been struggling with depression and PTSD for the last so many months. Um, multiple times I've had my firearm in my mouth ready to pull the trigger because I could not go on with it, with how I was dealing with life and how I felt. I was hopeless, lost, and I didn't know what, you know, what the purpose of life was really about. I read your book and I just want to say thank you. It helped me redefine why I want to still be living. Thank you for saving my life. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. Um, you know? And and I say that I'm like that, that's incredible. Are you sure it was my book? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I'm always in awe by those ones. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. It worked, huh? We got to the person at the time they needed us most, and and so we get a wide array of messages every single day saying stuff like that. We we got to those people when they needed us most, and and you know what the message we're trying to push through all the vehicles we use is eventually helping people become the happiest, healthiest, strongest, and most fulfilled version of themselves. Um, most recently we started a podcast called what the world needs more of. And, and it's focused on just that. It's me interviewing other people, just asking them, what do they believe the world needs more of asking them? What have they been through in their life? What's their, uh, you know, what's the moment that made them feel humbled What's the moment that made them feel excited. What's their greatest challenge? What's, what's been the, the deepest pains. And as we hear these moments, they bring us back to life to let people know, number one, you're not alone. Mm. You're going through a challenge. You're going through a tough time. You're not alone. Other people have been there. Number two, it's possible to get through it because you start to hear the fact that other people have survived and thrived through stuff like a double lung transplant mm -hmm. for the second time, who after her first double lung transplant, um, if you follow her on Instagram, her, her handle is fight the number two breathe. Her name's Kayla Herber. And I was talking to her and she said, listen, you know, from she had her double lung transplant, the hospital, it didn't work out. They told her there was nothing else they could do. And then they released her on that day and said, you should just go on hospice and slowly fade away. My goodness. And she came home with her husband and said, you know what? I fought my whole life. I'm not going to give up now. Help me figure out how to solve this. And he sat down and they, they wrote letters and emails to hundreds of hospitals. Most said they couldn't do anything. Four said they might be able to help. They got into one. She got put on a donor list. Uh, so many months later, she got approved and, and someone donated lungs and she was up for her second double lung transplant. He said the greatest day was the day watching her as she woke up and, you know, based on the medication was a little drowsy and kind of all over the place. But at one point she was writing on the board that she was using to communicate with and she was able to write, I can breathe. Mm. <laughs> and all her mentors through the process told her the greatest feeling you're ever going to have is when you take a deep breath and then your lungs work and they fill completely with air on your own without a ventilator, without machines, without assistance. And she said it was the greatest feeling, you know, next to being married. Uh, besides that, it was the greatest feeling she's ever had in her life. And I was like, wow. So having that kind of discussion, having a discussion with a friend of mine from high school that I, I, I didn't know these bits and pieces with where she shared on the show that it's her first, her, her second child, second time being a mother, but the first time getting to mother. She had a full-term pregnancy, death, meaning at the very, very end of the pregnancy, she was in the hospital ready to push, and it found out that it was going to be that the baby had passed away before it came out. Mm. And so even though she found that out, she still had to go through labor and physically push the baby out just as if it was everything was normal except for our, she already knew that the baby was gone. My goodness. And it was like, wow, how do you handle that? And again, for people who have gone through these types of situations to remind them that people have been there. They've gone through this. It's going to be okay. And then asking her, how, what, what helped? <laughs> yeah. like, I've never been there. What helped? She said, she told me she was going to sound so stupid, uh, but Pokemon Go helped. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, 
the the thing that you walk around parks with and yeah. try to capture like furry animals. He's like, yeah. And I said, how in the world did that help? And and it sounds like a distraction. And she goes, well, it kind of was. It gave us a reason to get outside of the house, into the sunlight, into the park, without having to talk about our pain. Interesting. I was like, wow. You know, I'm I'm a huge component of diving in and solving stuff, but sometimes giving yourself space to just be with it is also just as powerful and just as healing. Mm. And, and so these are the types of projects we work on because we, we want the ability to reach someone, remind them they're not alone, remind them that it's possible to heal and thrive and survive and get through these things. And, and then, you know, give them great experiences of listening to other people's experiences and learning how they did it and how they can apply that stuff to their life. I love the fact that you're all about letting people know that they're not alone. I think that, so many people are either embarrassed or they're, they're too self-conscious to admit that they're going through some things. And I watched a video today about that, that you put up on your, um, on your JRC TV on YouTube. The three things that teach important lessons, a hungry stomach, an empty wallet, and a broken heart. And when I watched that video, I was blown away because I think we've all experienced one of those at some time or another in our life. But what would you say separates... You said it teaches an important lesson. What do you say to the people who are unable to take the lesson out of the, the hungry stomach, the empty wallet, or the broken heart? I know you say it, it may take a couple times for you to actually pick up the lesson, but how can people pick up the lesson quicker? Um, well, the truth is the lesson is going to keep coming around until you finally get it. Mm. So if you – and the way people normally handle stuff like this is in the beginning they ignore it and they pretend like it's not there. Um after a while, they figure out that doesn't solve it. So then they blame it. They blame it on themselves. They blame it on the problem. They blame it on another person. They blame their circumstances. They blame where they came from. They blame where they're going. Like they blame anything just to blame it. So it's not their fault. Mm. And then eventually when you're tired of blaming it and that doesn't help when you're tired of ignoring it and that didn't help, eventually you got to solve it. And so what tends to happen is people go through these cycles of blaming, ignoring, blaming, ignoring. And then eventually they go, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm just going to solve it. I'm going to learn the lesson. I'm going to figure out how to apply myself. I'm going to figure out how to make it through this. And, and when they do that, all of a sudden, magic happens. And, and part of the reason the magic happened was they decided that they had control over it. When you're blaming someone else or something else, you have no control. Mm. When, you're, when you're ignoring it, you're, you have no control. You're pretending like it's not there so it can control you as much as it likes. Um, but when you, when you take it head on and say, listen, I might not have caused this, but it's in my life now. I'm going to figure out what to do with it. And I'm going to figure out what I can do with it and what's possible here. I'm going to take ownership of it and then take responsibility for doing something about it. And, and in that moment, now you have the ability to control at least how you feel or how you perceive what's going on. You can control like Victor Frankl says, the meaning, mm. what, what, what your logo the logo or meaning or association you have with it. And that can transform your life alone. Now, maybe you can control more than the meaning and not only find an empowering meaning from it, but maybe you can physically do something about it. You can go and say, listen, I'm going to stop stuffing donuts in my mouth. And I'm going to choose to eat some broccoli. Nice. It's like, okay, now you not only have a better meaning, but, but you can actually physically do something about it and make the change happen. Maybe, uh, you know, you did something in the past that, that, was really hurtful and you can go back and, and write that person a physical apology letter and physically do something about it that's very healing maybe um you know you, you did something wrong financially in the past and you can take the money back with interest and make it right i'm like i don't i don't know what was causing the person to feel this way but you can physically do something to change it as well um now, now the reason why people don't pick this stuff up is not beyond ignoring it or blaming it a lot of times they're very comfortable in the process of it, meaning they've been there for so long, that becomes their normal. That feels normal. It feels normal to always have problems. It feels normal to always be you know, upset and frustrated about something. It feels normal to always be angry. And, and therefore, they need a reset. They need to get around a, a community where that's not normal and people don't accept it. And there's a higher standard. You know, if, if you don't work out ever and then you go hang out with a bunch of bodybuilders, you'll start probably working out and eating a little bit healthier. Maybe not as crazy as them, but a lot better than you used to because you're in a peer group where there's a new standard being set. If you're around a peer group who's always moaning and complaining about problems, you'll probably start moaning and complaining about your problems. If you're in a peer group who always finds a way to take the challenges and turn them into something, 
that can be useful and applicable in their life, you'll start doing that too. So another way to, to, to transform situations like that is get around a peer group that doesn't accept anything but taking control of it, taking responsibility for it, and doing something with it. So the peer group, owning it, taking responsibility for it, all these things are things that people can choose. Um, but the real truth is, you know, a, a lady one time was on a cruise. She came back from a four-month cruise, and she told me a story. She goes, you know, life was trying to teach me a lesson, and I just wouldn't listen. I said, tell me what happened. She said, well, I was married. I had a super profitable business. I was super healthy, worked out all the time. Everything in my life was amazing. And I kept having this weird feeling that I just would, I just kept ignoring it, saying, you know, shut up, I'm busy, shut up, I'm busy. And eventually, one day, I came home and I found out my husband was cheating on me. And I was like, she was gutted. She said, oh my gosh. And then, you know, she's like, I should have done something then. But I, I was just like, you know, he's an idiot. He doesn't deserve me, whatever. I'm, I'm going to do it on my own. So she, she got out of that and kept going. And, and the same little feeling kept showing up. The same little lesson kept poking. And she's like, shut up. I'll just do it on my own. I'm fine. She ignored it again. You know, he's an idiot, blamed him, and then ignored the lesson. Eventually, something happened in her business. Her business completely fell apart. All of her business started falling apart. One thing after the next thing after the next thing. All at cascading events. And she was like, wow. She's like, okay. She came up with an excuse about that. And then eventually... Physically, like I remember something, either an earthquake, tornado, or some natural disaster, like jacked up her physical house. And she's like, you know what? I need to stop ignoring this. And she's like, but I really feel like I need to just, you know, work harder. And then eventually she went to the doctor and the doctor's like, hey, you have cancer. Mm. And at that point, it was like, okay, I need to surrender. I need to stop fighting this gut feeling. I need to stop ignoring the fact that something's going on in my life. So what she landed up doing was she leveraged the business to have someone else run it for her. She sold the house. Um, she, she, you know, went and got healthy and then she landed up taking this trip for four months around the world and, and refiguring out what she was really all about. What was her real true top values in life? What was most important to her and how she was going to align everything she was doing with those values instead of ignoring those values and just trying to do something because she made it a priority and was trying to fight her nature every day. And eventually when she came back, she says, you know what? I found so much peace and so much tranquility because I decided, and you know, after her and I talked, I was like, oh, you figured out what your ideal day was. She figured out how she wanted to live her day-to-day -day life instead of just forcing herself to grind through it to hopefully get to somewhere someday. And she started, she said, you know, this is how I want to live my everyday life. I was like, wow, that's really cool. And I said, what does the future look like if you live every day like that? She's like, well, you know, here's what five years look like, 10 years, 20 years. I'm like, that's amazing. And I was like, you know, who, who, what's the difference between who you are now and who you were back then when you were just forcing it? She's like, you know, back then, like I was a, a, a mean, you know, all kinds of derogatory words of herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was a mean blah, 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 blah. And I was like, wow, unhealthy, unhappy, frustrated, ignoring all this stuff. I'm like, who are you now? And she's like, wow, you know what? I'm loving, I'm caring, I'm grounded, I'm alive. I feel free and abundant and excited and passionate. She's like, I feel like I'm myself again. I'm like, holy moly. And all it took was her ability. Well, it took a lot because she didn't listen. You know, she could have learned the lesson before her husband landed up cheating on her. And it's not to make an excuse for him. That was a stupid decision on his part. Mm. And when you're ignoring your spouse to just work 24-7, it's pretty easy for them to get distracted doing something else as well. Yep. Now, sometimes it's another person. Sometimes they get distracted in another business just to occupy their time because you're ignoring them. Sometimes they get occupied with the kids because you're not paying attention to them. It's something else. It's so, same equivalent of cheating. It, it's just doing it some other way. It's filling their time with things other than actually having a relationship together because their spouse is ignoring them and putting something else as a higher priority in their life. From there, you know, same thing happened in her business. She was so busy doing her own stuff in her way and her life and her situation. She wasn't paying attention or taking care of her team and it started to fall apart and crumble. Same thing eventually happened in her health. It was so funny. She was so busy trying to get her goal she didn't even pay attention to her own health, which is part of her, as silly as that was. She ignored her spouse. She ignored her team. She ignored herself. 
her own health. And eventually it all burnt down. Mm. And so in that process of having life, number one, send her a whisper. She, she told me that she goes, you know, life sent me a whisper a long time ago and I just ignored it because I was too busy. You know, and she said, then life hugged a brick at me when my husband cheated on me, when I got sick, when my business got jacked up, when my house got jacked up, that was a big old brick. And I still didn't pay attention. She said, eventually life burnt my whole damn house down to get me to pay attention. You know, my business failed, my health got jacked up and there was nowhere else I could hide. And eventually I had to face it. And she's like, when I took these three months to really figure out who the heck I was, I've come back now. I know who I am. I know what I really want. I know what I'm about. And I'm not going to allow myself to get distracted by other people's goals or other people's needs, wants, or desires. I'm going to stay true to my core values and allow myself to really be congruent with what I know I'm here to do in this world. And it's like, wow, different human being. And so in that book, we talk about aligning your core values, figuring out what they are, figuring out how to align them, figuring out how to live true to them every week instead of doing other stuff that you think you're quote unquote supposed to be doing. And so this is a lot of what happened in this woman's life is she was living true to her core values now. And then she was healthy and abundant and all kinds of stuff. She was very free as a human from that experience. Jarek, that was, uh, Kevin and I were looking at each other the whole time going, wow. So what are the, you've obviously met so many people and you've worked with so many people, coached thousands of people, spoken to probably hundreds of thousands at this point. So to say that you've recognized some patterns is probably a big understatement. What are the indicators of those whispers so that people can maybe be more proactive when they maybe be heading for when life is trying to the universe is trying to whisper at them to make a change? So whispers take some level of intuition. It, it takes the ability to step back and just listen, which means it, it takes time. It takes space and it takes, you know, silence with yourself takes the ability to have time to meditate, time to work out, time to relax. Most of us cram everything into every square minute of every day so that we don't have to ever sit and listen to what's real inside of ourselves. I think most people are honestly afraid to have to see themselves. It's why people, when they get home, instead of sitting there and enjoying the fact that they're home and they're living and they're breathing and they're alive, Instead, they race off to go to the next meeting. They race off to go to the bar. They race off to go to the next thing. They race off to do the next thing. And they're really just running from that space where they could just be and experience themselves and listen to their own thoughts and listen to their own feelings. And I think as we get more comfortable creating that space where we can just be and whether that's, you know, walking in the park and then taking a bench with a journal and saying, hey, what's on my mind right now? Whether it's sitting down in your 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 writing chair in your house, taking a pen and paper and saying, hey, what's on my mind right now? But it's allowing your brain to really pour out all the thoughts and all the feelings and all the different things going on and just observing them and, and experiencing them and looking for trends. And a lot of times what will happen is if you do this for 30 days in a row, you'll notice trends. You'll notice predominant thoughts continuously in your mind. You'll notice things that you're constantly thinking about. And you got to remember that thoughts turn into vibrations. Vibrations eventually turn into your reality. And so if you're thinking about something constantly, your body is going to start vibrating that frequency. As your body starts to vibrate that frequency, you're going to start to experience it in your day-to-day -day life. You know, I had someone comment on a post the other day because I used a cuss word in it. And she said, only angry people cuss. And I said, that's so interesting. Because I've noticed that angry people tend to see anger everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. happy people tend to see happiness everywhere they go. Loving people tend to see love in everything, everywhere they go. So what do you see? Question mark. Cause if she sees anger, I'm guessing she just has a lot of anger inside of her. Cause when I see a cuss word, I don't see anger. Depends on what word it is. Sometimes I see love. Sometimes I see strength. Sometimes I see creativity. Sometimes I see happiness. You know, it depends on, on what's going on, the context of it. But you only see the things that are already inside of you. And so that concept of as you're going through life and as you're experiencing stuff, as you're mapping out your vision, as you're, you're looking for these little patterns, the number one predominant pattern you're going to experience is whatever is inside of you is going to constantly show up around you. Wow. 
So if you don't like what's showing up around you, you probably need to take some time to dig inside of yourself and figure out why it's there. Figure out how to love it. Figure out how to heal it. Figure out how to replace it with something that you want more of. And when you replace it on the inside, all of a sudden the outside will completely transform and everywhere you go, you'll only see that new thing that you've now put inside. That's, um, Jarek, the, the digging deep, being willing to look in the mirror, that's how this podcast started, basically. I realized that I wasn't the best version of myself. I realized that I knew a lot of my shortcomings, but I wasn't willing to make the choice to change them. Um, so the fact that you just went deep like that, I appreciate the hell out of that because that resonated with me so highly. I cannot even explain to you. And that, that's a good segue into what I wanted to say next. So I, I watched another one of your videos. I watched a whole bunch of your videos. I was blown away by the questions that you ask. Your questions are amazing because they make you dig deep and get answers. And one of the questions you asked was, what decision do you need to make today to change the history of your life. And you gave a couple examples like Rosa Parks, um, Nelson Mandela, and how they made a decision, a choice, to stand up for what they believed in, and they changed history. So can you explain where that thought process came from of, it really, tomorrow can be a totally different day if you make a decision today and you make a change today. So can you go into an example maybe of where you use that or where that thought actually came from for you? Sure. So the, the thought of making a decision to transform history is pretty simple. It, it's nothing more than an observation. It's the observation of the fact that people throughout history, when things changed, it was because someone made a decision. You know, someone decided to stand up for what they believe in. Someone decided to say no more or never again, or yes, I will make this happen, or I will find a way, or I will make a way, or I do love you, or I do, let's begin, um, or it's over, this is the end. All those are moments of decisions. And so those moments of decisions transform the, you know, your entire experience of, of the future, of what's about to happen next. And, and so thinking back to what decision needs to be made uh, to rewrite the stars for your family tree, what decisions need to be made to, to write the history that you want to have written about you instead of the thing that you think is going to be written about you. So often if we sit down and project what does the future look like, which we talk about in chapter 12 of my book, what's your 5, 10, 20 year vision for your life. If you project out into the future, a simple way to look at it is if I continue to do the daily habits I'm doing right now, where will I be in five years from now? What are these habits going to add up to? If I do it for 10 years, where will I be? If I do it for 20 years, where will I be? What are my daily habits, my daily rituals? What do these things actually add up to? And do some math, put it on paper and multiply it out. You know, if, if, if you eat healthy every day and work out, what does that lead to 10 years from now? If you eat crap and avoid working out, what does that lead to 10 years from now? We're, we're human. We can figure this out. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. We're all smart. And it's, <laughs> if, if, if you look at these things, then you got to make a decision and say, well, where do I actually want to be? What I've noticed is, and I always draw this on a little flip chart for people. And if I make a little you know, a little chart and I put X where we're at now in the very bottom left corner. And I, I say, well, where do you ultimately want to be? What's your vision? And I'm going to put that as a Y all the way up in the top right corner and say, tell me about your goals. And people say, well, I want to be super healthy and have lots of money and have an amazing relationship and have this incredible life and have everything I've ever dreamed of. And I say, okay, so you're talking about the goals and the life and the experience of the 1%. And then they look at me funny and they go, no, I don't want to be a greedy bastard. <laughs> yeah. And I said, what, what? You said, you, you said the 1%. Those are the Wall Street people who steal all our money. Uh, let me and I said, really? Sure. Yep. You're telling me that you don't want to be the 1% of givers in the community that you live in? You don't want to be one of the top people who give the most to the things that matter to you in, in your own community, to your church, to the community center, to the, to, to the people who need it the most. You don't want to be the 1% of givers. You're telling me you don't want to be the 1% of couples that have the most amazing, passionate, out of this world love life. Like you want to have boring average sex with each other every night as a couple. <laughs> like, you don't want to be the 1% of people who are healthier and happier and stronger and more fulfilled than anyone in your community. And it's not about comparison. It's just saying, Hey, why not be one of the best? 
You don't want to be have that one percent level of spirituality where you feel deeply connected and grounded in everything that you do every day. That the universe has your back and you're being guided in pure faith in all that you do and everything that you do. People are like, well, when you put it that way, it sounds pretty cool. I'm like, okay, great. So you want the one percent results, but that's the one percent. It's a very small percentage of people on Earth who will ever experience that kind of day to day life. The average person. Remember, survives on a few dollars a day, works all day long and all night long just to put food on the table and have clean water. Most people do not live in a place that has sanitary drinking water, that has you know clean systems and processes and organizations as far as the city is concerned and sanitary, sanitary uh, toilets and all this jazz. I've, I've lived in a village in Africa. Most people don't have access to this stuff. So when you look at most people and, and look in the community or city you live in, most people in your city, are they truly, genuinely happy? Mm. Every day they wake up so grateful to be alive, so excited to just have the opportunity to go out into the world and do something. The answer is usually no. Are they truly, wildly, passionately in love with each other? Where you see these people and they hold hands and they kiss and they're constantly telling each other how much they love each other and how much they appreciate each other? The answer is usually no. They're usually saying, stop that. Stop being such an ass. Why are you always do that? <laughs> uh, get away from me. I can't stand them. Like you hear stuff like this all day. So that's not most people. Most people, are they deeply spiritually grounded and connected no matter what life throws their way? They know it's all going to work out in in the right way in the long run. No, little tiny things happen and people freak the hell out and go, oh my God, it's all over. We're going to die. You're like, wow, these are most people. So this is the 99%. But here's the question. Do the habits you have lead you to the 99% results that everyone gets? Or do the habits you have actually lead to the 1% goals that you have? This is where you can get real with yourself and figure out what your future really looks like. Because if you're not doing the habits that actually lead to the results you want, you're going to get the results you deserve. They're just not the ones you desire. (laughs) Because whatever habits you're doing day in and day out are going to add up to the actual life results you're going to achieve. And this is where you want to mark it out on the board and say, okay, if I look five years, 10 years, and 20 years in the future, if I do this little habit every day from now until then, where am I going to be? How do I feel about that? And are there any adjustments needed? And at that point, you can go back to what we talked about, which is making a decision that if you want that life, that 1% of results in whatever category of life is most important to you, you're going to have to make the decision every day to do the little activities that actually lead to that result long term. Jarek, um, you're blowing my mind right now. It's, it's, <laughs> I posted two days ago on Instagram a quote. It says, what might I regret in the future if I continue living the way I'm living right now? Ask yourself this question constantly. I, um, we were on a podcast yesterday with one of my mentors, Terrence McMahon, and he very candidly admitted that he lived a very large portion of, portion of his life um, you know, incorrectly. And he's turned it all around, um, after he had liver failure and a liver transplant. And, um, you talk a whole lot in your book and in your work about applying a huge meaning to even the simplest tasks. And my favorite book on the planet is a book called the compound effect. I'm very sure you've probably heard of it. And the reason is because if people understood the power of these small daily seemingly insignificant disciplines, um, whether it's with fitness or your family, just basically not neglecting the things, the little things that make a big difference. And so my question for you is, can you please bring the listeners through that experience that you had in Uganda where, you you know, you mentioned some people don't have clean drinking water and you had to travel basically a couple miles to then get water, then bring it back, then boil it just to have clean drinking water. And Spending, can you, can you bring the listeners some perspective on what the rest of the world is actually like? Um, and I also really was hoping that you would tell the story about the guy sweeping the um, porch off and how much significance he brought to that, that simple daily task. Sure. And, and so th- this is all perspective. It depends on where you live and it depends on what you've gone through. Uh, and the, the greatest gift you can give yourself at some point in your life is the travel to places you've never been before. Now, for some people, that might be getting in, in a car or getting on the bus and, and going a few cities away and just seeing what life is like in that city. 
and you know do do your best to drive around or, or go walk around and look for the nicest parts of the city and do your best to go and look for the the hardest parts of the city the poorest parts of the city my wife and I just went to India recently. I took her there for a weekend to go see the Taj Mahal to celebrate our anniversary. And while we were there, we visited the Taj Mahal. We stood at a very nice hotel. We drove by the presidential palace and saw that it has hundreds of rooms and he switches rooms every night. And we were like, wow, this place is amazing. And then on Sunday, you know, we took time to say, hey, let's go give back to people struggling in this place. We've never been to this specific part of town before. Let's look for them and let's figure out how we can help. So we went to a store and we created these little gift bags that had a bar of soap, a toothbrush, toothpaste, um, a snack, a little juice in them, a bottle of water, like all these little things someone might need who, who's struggling. And we drove around and we looked for people who were in some of the hardest parts of town that we could find, the most difficult living situations. And we just surprised people and we walked through and just said, hey, brought you something, handed it to them. And they were like, wow, you know, and they were, they were, you know, making like thank you thank you symbols and and waving and and more people showed up and then we kind of jumped in the car and went to the next place and and we just kept doing it and what happened was we got to see perspective we got to see the fact that there's people living better than we've ever experienced in our entire life and we go wow that's possible (laughs) Look at that. That's amazing. Yep. (laughs) And then you know we got we got to see and this was real life. Like we were standing outside the palace at I think midnight and we're like, wow, there's really like 400 rooms in that building. That's amazing. I've never been inside of a building with 400 bedrooms. <laughs> like, that's a lot of them. <laughs> um, and and uh, like, that's incredible. You know, it's like a personal hotel filled with whatever he wants. He's, he's the president, the prime minister, whatever it was. And then we got to walk through and see these little people who sleep literally on the ground outside near the train tracks. And we're like, wow. Holy mackerel. And these people are really struggling and then find a way to help. And in that contrast, you know, it's part of traveling somewhere we've never been. We get to see the contrast. And every city has contrast like this if you look for it. Yeah. Every city has people who are doing extraordinarily well in some category of their life where you can just sit there and go, wow, look at that. And every city has contrast where you can go sit next to someone and go, holy mackerel, how did this happen? And not even, you know, just feel their pain and just, oh my gosh, how can I help? Um, and that's in every category of life. Again, you know, you can go sit somewhere at the gym and see some of the fittest people you've ever seen in your life and go, holy mackerel, that's possible? Wow. And then you can go to the hospital and sit outside and watch people struggling with the opposite side of it and go, oh, geez, if I don't take care of myself, that's what happens. And as you start to experience contrast, you see what's possible on the scales of life. And as you see what's possible, now you can calibrate and decide what you want to experience in life. So one thing that happened to me was in university, I took a course or a, a semester called Semester at Sea. And it's a cruise ship that goes around the world in, in a whole semester. All your professors on board. So it was hosted by the University of Pittsburgh when I did it. So we, we did transfer credits. We applied to the University of Pittsburgh. I got in uh, for this semester. And then we went and got on the ship. And we went from Vancouver to Japan to China um, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Thailand, India, Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa, Brazil, Venezuela, back up to Florida. All that in 110 days, roughly. My goodness. And when, we, when we were at sea, we studied um, and did our classwork every day. And then when we were in port, we got to go explore and take our classwork and see how we could apply it to the different places that we visited. So I was studying cross-cultural psychology and interpersonal psychology, sociology, and I, I was studying how people tick. And so every time I'd enter a country, I would have just studied a whole bunch about different communities and societies. And then I get to go watch how people really do it. And we learned about a collectivist society of how people do a lot of things similar to each other. When we got to China, walked around, we're like, holy mackerel, it's really true. People are like that here. That's incredible. You know, we learned about human sexuality and how people interact with each other and how they pick each other up out in the community. And, you know, some of the countries, we'd sit in a bar and watch people. Um, use social cues to try to attract each other. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> was like, wow, they really do these things. This is interesting. And it's different in Kenya than it is in, uh, you know, India. Totally different attraction strategies of how they try to lure each other over to talk and communicate. It's interesting. It's fun. Um, a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences. So we were learning all this stuff. And when I, when I got to East Africa, um, 
something about it to me felt very warm and friendly and alive. And I, I really just jived with the culture and the vibe and the trend that was going on. And so I remember we were walking around and I mean, we had a wonderful day there as students where it cost us 10 bucks each. And we took a cab to a boat to a little island where they literally hand caught fish with a net and they, they cut up potatoes and made us fish and chips right smack on the beach from fresh fish that came right out of a net of the ocean. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. They were like, that was incredible. And, and while we were there, though, I also noticed the cities were beautiful. And there was also, you know, rural farming villages kind of spread out that we went through. And I remember seeing these villages and thinking, wow. I mean, these people physically live in mud huts, like little houses made out of mud and sticks and wood. I was like, holy moly. They really live like this. This is crazy. I've never seen this in my life. Like I've seen homeless people in a tent, but I've never seen people living in a mud hut with a thatch roof. Mm. Now they, wow. And then I started talking to people and getting to know what was going on. And they said, yeah, you know, the villages are very humble and people struggle a lot. And I was like, do people help? And they're like, yeah, they try to help. And here's how and stuff like that. And I just remember it touched my heart. Went on for the next month and a half, finished the trip, came back home. And when I got home, I remember listening to a lot of friends back in University of San Diego. And they were talking about stuff they were buying and outfits they were wearing and what car they wanted and, and you know, what was going to be cool and, and what TV shows were funny or annoying. And I remember scratching my head thinking, wow, they're literally consumed and obsessed with nonsense. Mm. Like none of this matters to me. Mm. You know, they're, they're consumed. There's so many things that, yeah, it's entertaining. Yeah, it's interesting. But it's nothing more than just a distraction from the fact that people are hurting. There's a lot of people struggling around the world. And none of these people seem to care. And it just didn't feel right. And I decided I looked up an organization at the time, it was called Student Partnership Worldwide. Now it's called Restless Development. They've changed their name over time. Um, and I remember just saying, you know what? I want to go volunteer. I want to go help. I, I want to go make a difference to someone who really needs the help right now. So I looked up the different programs. I saw there was one based in, in Uganda, and it was focused on organic farming, helping you know the, the farmers in the villages. So you know what? I'm going to do it. So I signed up for it. Packed up my bags, shipped myself all the way from California over to Uganda, showed up. We spent the first you know, week, couple weeks learning all the techniques of how to deliver this information into the, the villages. Then they split us up in the little core groups and planted us in all the villages. And, and we had the next so many months to go work and help all the local farmers uh, learn how to apply all these techniques to their farming. And, and while I was there, it, it was tr- just a life-changing experience. Like you said... You know, I had to walk a quarter mile carrying a couple of jugs just to go to the pump of the well to fill up these jugs of water to then carry them home, which is hard to do with a lot of water uh, because they're swaying everywhere. So I was wobbling down the road trying to carry these two giant jugs. Good for and the then traps, I get Jared. back to a little. <laughs> I'm so kidding. it's good to stay in shape. It's a strong man competition, basically. Yeah. I do it every day. And so. You know, you have to boil. You have to pour the water into a pan. You got to start the fire. Light. You know, boil the water. Then you got to let it cool without letting any bugs or anything get in it. And then you finally have a glass of water to drink after all that. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. People have to go through all those steps just to have a glass of water. Like there is no such thing as a uh, a drinking fountain at the park. Like there's, it doesn't exist in some parts of the world. And I remember just be blown away by that. Like. In Los Angeles or San Diego, you can go to a park. There's a drinking fountain. You walk up, take a sip of water. It's not going to kill you. You're totally fine. Like that doesn't exist in this part of the world. I was just like, wow, there's no water. From there, for food, you know, you'd go to the market and be like, oh, I'm looking for this. Do you have it? And they'd be like, nope, we don't have any more. Like, are you going to get any more? Maybe. I mean, if someone finds it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're like, wow, there's no like grocery store. Like they don't, they don't even have consistent food. It's just whatever grew that day. Yeah, we hope. Uh, you're like, okay, this is interesting. And you don't know if it'll be there tomorrow or next week. No, no clue. Kind of whatever's there is what you have a chance to eat. And I'm like, that's different. You know, when I grew up, like you go to the store and you buy whatever you want. Now I'm in a position of this is what they have and you can only have whatever they have. That's it. It's the only thing available. Like interesting. And, and then as we went through this process, it was really life changing. No running water, no electricity, no toilet, just out in the villages. And at one point, I made it a point to watch the sunrise every single morning. And it was my favorite thing to do in the mornings there 
um, because I just lean out the window of the place I was staying and I just watched the sunrise over the pineapple fields, which were gorgeous. These most beautiful colors. I mean, I, I never seen colors like that. I grew up in San Diego. That's not what the soil is different. It, it doesn't glow the same. The sun doesn't look the same rising there. And so every morning I made it a point to wake up and watch it. And uh, what was incredible is every single morning, about 100 yards outside of my window, there was this little old man who'd come out, grab this long thatch broom, and he would just sweep the leaves off this path. And he'd be like, step, step, sweep, sweep, step, step, sweep, sweep. And he'd go all the way down this long dirt path, all the way to the main road. Then he'd kind of stretch a little and then turn around and work his way back. Step, step, sweep, sweep, step, step, sweep, sweep, all the way back to the porch. And when he got to the porch, he would turn around and he'd set the broom down and he would stand there and have the biggest smile on his face I've ever seen. Just so big, so proud of that moment. And I remember watching him and just thinking, why in the heck is he so happy about that? Like, <laughs> he's always doing it at sunrise. He does the same thing every day in the exact same way, in the exact same pattern. He has, he has a habit. Every day he delivers this result and he does his exact routine. And then he's so happy about it. And, it, you know, if he was miserable about it, it's like, ah, pfft threw the broom down and walked away. I probably wouldn't have been curious, but seeing someone so happy over doing something so simple was like blowing my mind. Cause you know, I, I had friends who started businesses and built companies and had families and traveled and they're freaking miserable. And I see this guy just sweeping freaking dirt and he's so happy. And I'm like, okay, what's this happy guy all about? And so after about 30 days of watching this guy, I went and interviewed him and you know, I took a friend who spoke the local language and we, we asked him, you know, why do you do what you do? And he looked at her and he said, because I'm supposed to. And I remember feeling real frustrated and be like, no, like, why do you do what you do? <laughs> What's the purpose? What's the reason? What's the meaning? I had all these words. And, and so I asked my friend and she laughed. She goes, OK, let me ask again. She asked him differently. And then all of a sudden he got the biggest smile on his face. And I'm like, yeah, that what is it? And then she said, wow, he said something really beautiful. He said, the reason I sweep the leaves is because I believe every human being, every human being, whether it's a small child about to enter this world or a sick or elderly person about to leave this world through the clinic, through, he worked a little hospital there, through the clinic, whether it's a small child about to enter this world or a sick or elderly person about to leave this world, they deserve a clear path to do so. Mm. And I remember in that moment just thinking, Wow wow, how did that happen? How did this little old man find so much meaning in such a simple task? Now, you know, there's a second part to the story now because years later, I was living in San Diego and I remember I, I was working on a project and um, I think it was about noon and I'd taken a break and I was in, in the living room kitchen area of the house and I was just sweeping the floor. In San Diego, it was about the sand. We were by the beach. So there was the sand always in the house. So I was just sweeping up the sand. And one of my friends kind of came by and he poked his head and he goes, hey, what are you doing? He said, sweeping the floor. And he goes, wait a minute. Shouldn't you be doing high revenue producing activities right now? <laughs> He's like, you own a business, don't you? And I said, yeah, I own a business. And he says, well, this is a low revenue or no revenue producing position. So you should be paying someone to do the sweeping the floor so that you could focus on high revenue producing activities in your business. And I said, well, what's the point of that? And he says, well, and I, I know what it is, but I was just teasing him. And he goes, well, <laughs> you know, if you're focused on high revenue producing activities, you can grow your business and make more money. I said, and then what? And he says, then you can hire more people and then they can help you grow your business even more. I said, and then what? <laughs> he said, then you can make so much money that eventually you can move to the beach, not have to worry about work and totally relax and enjoy your life. And I started laughing. And here's a crazy thought. If I could learn to enjoy sweeping the floor, do you think I could enjoy that whole journey? Mm. Versus here's a crazier thought. If I don't enjoy sweeping the floor right now, what makes you think I'm going to enjoy any of those steps you just described? And he looked at me real funny. He goes, I don't know. I got to get back to work. <laughs> and he threw him off. <laughs> that Obviously, was it didn't land with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was his whisper. Can't win them all. If you think about it. Yeah. Exactly. Can't win them all. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but if I can't enjoy sweeping the floor, 
what makes you think I'm going to enjoy any of that process? Even when I finally get done and I just get to sit there and enjoy my life. How the hell am I going to enjoy it if I can't enjoy something as simple as sweeping the floor? But if I can enjoy sweeping the floor, I bet I can enjoy every single step of that journey. And even if I never get to the end, at least I enjoyed every moment of it. And if I landed up dying halfway through, I could give myself a high five on the way out. Mm. And it's that concept of how do you find deep meaning and purpose in all that you do so you can find deep joy in all that you do so that truly, no matter how far you go in life or what you accomplish or don't, you can enjoy every moment of it. I absolutely love that. That's beautiful. All of that. Everything you just said, it makes sense that, especially when you have your purpose or your passion and you know, you know, you feel as if you know why you're here. Everything starts to make sense. And becoming a better version of yourself every day to help you get to your ultimate purpose is progress. And in the grand scheme of things, we all want to be the best versions of ourselves, I think whether we admit it or not. So we only have like seven minutes left. So I'm going to hammer a question, Alan will hammer a question, and then we will let you plug away where people can find you and all that happy jazz. Um, Alan and I connect very deeply on our upbringings. So we both grew up without fathers for different reasons. Uh, My dad just kind of left because, I don't know, I don't think he was ready for a kid. Um, I'll let Alan explain his situation. But I've always had a chip on my shoulder And I I feel like that's something I've always carried with me. And obviously your father is one of the most successful people, motivational speakers. He's changed so many lives. Um, He's one of the most successful men of all time. So what motivated you to become the man you are today? What motivated me to become the man I am today? Um, I'm not sure. I guess it's probably a series of events over time. Contemplation moment right now for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff. I, I'm The reason I like business and sales, if I look back, I was telling the story the other day where when I was probably five, six years old, my grandma bought a little suit for me from Nordstrom's and taught me the whole sales presentation for life insurance for the company she worked with and used to take me on sales presentations and I'd give the presentation with her at like five, six years old. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Love I remember it. going to the office with her when I was a little kid and when she would have cold calling nights and you know, every time she made an appointment, I'd get to run up to the board and pull a dollar off and be like, hey. You know, I, I remember going to some of my dad's events over the years and, and being around the seminars and being like, hey, this is kind of fun. I remember, you know, going to my mom would go work the swap meets on the weekend, selling stuff with for my uncle's business. And she, you know, she'd be able to make a few thousand dollars in a weekend for extra spending money. And I remember growing up there being like, cool, you can make a ton of money if you learn how to sell stuff. And so all these little layers started, you know, winding in. I remember when I was a little kid going and doing volunteer work with my mom and my dad and helping people in need. So I, I think most likely it was probably a, a whole series of experiences stacked up together and a combination of, of learning how to be an entrepreneur and grow businesses, learning how to, to do sales, learning how to you know, give and take care of the community around us. All these little layers kind of piece together into a, a lot of which the things that drive me today. That is a beautiful answer. I love that. Um, and to, to uh, elaborate on what Kevin mentioned, um, my, my father passed away when I was two. And um, I do think that for a long time, I kind of, you know, ran from that fact, but um, I think I've really used the idea of legacy and the power of it because I kind of grew up in an environment where everyone would talk about John, you know, my dad, and I, I realized very quickly how much of a strong impact the little things we do every day matter. And it seems like that seems to be a very recurring theme in your life, Jarek, and I, that's why I resonated so strongly with your work is you know, there's a lot of personal development material out there, as you know, because you've been immersed in this world for the personal development world for your you know entire life. Um, but I think that there's this quote that comes to mind. I think you'll recognize it by Jim Carrey. He says, you know, I wish that everyone could become rich and famous so they would realize that that's not where they're going to find their sense of completion. And what I love about you the most right. is the ideal um, day vision and the fact that I've learned a lot about vision Uh, my whole life. Steve Jobs was one of my heroes growing up as a kid. And, um, you know, he obviously didn't have his, his birth father either, but 
um, you talk about having a vision for today that's in alignment with a vision for the future. And I think that that is so incredibly unique because, like you said, if you can't enjoy sweeping that floor now, what makes you think you're going to enjoy the Mai Tais on the beach or the any of the process in between? So um, the question that I always ask the guests, um, and I am so unbelievably fascinated to ask you this question, I believe that we grow, we evolve, we adapt, we change. That's what this podcast is about, becoming aware of that process and how to make sure you're designing a life on your own terms rather than, you know, just kind of reacting to the world around us as, as it gets more and more overstimulated. So my question for you is, I do believe, although we grow and adapt and change, and of course you have over the years at 34 now, um, I think there's a part of us, I wear a, a chain around my neck, it's a true north, um, North Star. And, you know, it's unwavering. It's the brightest star in the sky. It never changes. It never moves. Um, what about you never changed? Um, probably just the, the, and it's always weird saying this. I remember I was at an event with Seth Godin and I asked him, you know, about his son. I said, hey, what would you tell your son on how to differentiate himself on what makes him uniquely him? And, and just cause you know, he works in your company and how would you help him differentiate? And he turned it around. He said, I don't think this has anything to do with my son. I think this has to do with you. Mm. And I was like, okay. And, and he says, you know, if you want to know what makes you different, he said, I, I followed your work. I know who you are. I know what you do. I know who your dad is. He says, what makes you different from everyone else in the world around you is the fact that you care. You really do. I've watched how much time you take responding to people. I've watched how much time and effort you put into helping others for no good reason, but just to help. And he goes, that, that's, your, that's your purple cow. That's what makes you unique is you really care. And I remember laughing in that moment thinking, I have no clue how to turn that into a website <laughs> slogan. It's like, welcome to jerickrobbins.com. Yeah. I care. <laughs> Like anyone who says that shit, you really second get. You're like, really? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is that why you wrote it on your website, bro? Yeah. Come on, really? Like, I don't trust the person who fucking says that shit. Yeah. And, and exactly. So I'm like, okay, Seth, you just screwed me because I have no clue how to tell the world that. Yeah. Except exactly. for telling them that Seth said it, and that that should be helpful. Um, <laughs> I think that's the part that never changes. Is I really do care. I I, I spend hours every day answering random direct messages from people and just helping them. I don't need anything from them. Like, if you want to buy my program? Great. Buy it. If you don't, awesome. I'm still going to help you. And so I help people all day long. I mean, I help my I have a business around this. So we have clients and we service them and help their businesses grow and help them become happy, healthy, strong, and fulfilled and optimize human beings. Uh, we help with their company cultures and all this other jazz. And for the people who aren't in those positions from all over the world who send us messages every day, we spend time helping them too, just because we can and, and I think if we have the ability to help someone in a moment of need, why not step up and show up for them and really deliver? And who knows? Maybe they'll just be a friend. Maybe they'll be someone we helped. Maybe they'll turn into a client down the road. I don't know. And, it, and that's not the point. The point is I have the ability to help them now, so I'll step up and deliver. And I think that's the unwavering part that's been with me for a very, very long time. Well, we appreciate you helping us and helping our listeners. I think they're going to see that digging deep in your mind really will open up a door of possibilities and endless possibilities. So where can people find you online? We are going to link all of your information, but for those who are driving and can't look at it, uh, where can they find you on Instagram, Facebook, all that happy jazz? Where can they purchase your programs? Um, so if you go to Instagram, you can find me. It's just at Jarek Robbins. If you go to Google, just type in Jarek Robbins. It's J-A-I-R-E-K-R-O-B-B-I-N-S. It'll bring up my website. It'll bring up Instagram. It'll bring up all kinds of awesomeness about us. Um, but, but I would say a few places where you'll get the most amount of content for free that we're pushing out. Instagram, if, you're on, if you like podcasts, just search for the podcast, What the World Needs More Of um, with Jarek Robbins, and you'll see it there. Uh, if, if you like online programs, you can go to High Performance. Uh, what is it? High Performance. 27.com and it'll take you to our program with a massive discount if you want to get a high performance program. Mm. Uh, but all, all those things are options. Find me on Instagram, come hang out, say hello, say that you listen to me on the podcast. I uh, love that. Love to connect with y'all. All right, Jarek, thank you so much. One thing I just want to say about the fact that you care. Um, when I came across your book, I was, I was in the living room. I know you don't have a lot of time, but this will be super fast. I really feel compelled to share this with you. I was in the kitchen 
and um, you were on the Ultimate Health podcast, and that was my ex girlfriend Jenny Jenny's favorite podcast. And I I heard your voice from the living room, and I'm like, what are you listening to? And she's like, oh, this is the Ultimate Health podcast. I'm like, I recognize that voice. And she immediately said, she's like, oh, this is this is Tony Robbins' son. She knew I was a fan of Tony, and and she was very very um, particular about the voice on audiobooks. We listened to a lot of different audiobooks together, but this one in particular, your book. She really wanted to listen to, um, and she said that she loved your voice because she can, she said this, and I remember this, and she'll attest to this when I send her this episode, which is a dream come true for, for me. She said, you can tell he just really cares. It comes oh. through your voice. And so you're doing awesome stuff, and Jarek, you reached out to me almost immediately. Um, everyone, Jarek is very responsive. He obviously cares, and he proves it with his actions. Thank you so much, Jarek, for coming on the show, and I hope our paths cross. So oh, very welcome. Thank you for having me. Jarek, thank you so very much. Keep changing the world. That is what you're doing. And uh, you are, I think you're living your purpose every day. And we are unbelievably grateful to have been able to spend some time with you today, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon, Jarek. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for listening to another episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. Going hyperconscious will absolutely change your life because if you understand why something is the way it is, now you have the power to change it. If you going hyperconscious with us has changed your life in any way, please share this episode with one of your friends because the more people that go hyperconscious, the better this world's going to be for everybody. And if you would kindly leave us a five star review on iTunes, that would help us make more people hyperconscious and we would be greatly appreciative. Thank you. Bye.